Good afternoon. Good to see you all. Um, whenever Jennifer and Derek ask me to do something, I uh, always say yes. <laughs> and I always say yes, not just because we're friends, but because it's always a rich, interesting experience. And I get to meet a lot of new and interesting people who I can learn a lot from. So it's always good to do this. You know, when I think about, and, and they've asked me to talk about my uh, experience as I've seen public-private partnerships evolve over time. It's been quite a few years now. I started in public-private partnership business before it was even called that in actually 1977 in Honduras, and I'll get to that in a minute. But whenever I consider my experience in public-private partnerships, it always reminds me in a way of that uh, Chinese proverb. There's a lot of Chinese proverbs, so you can always find one that fits for what you want to the point you want to make, but the one that, that reminds me in terms of the work with public-private partnerships goes something like this. Tell me and I forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I'll understand. And I think that's exactly what we find when we're working together in terms of partnerships. You really have to have people involved to understand. You can talk a lot about it, but it's nothing like working in it. I want to talk to you about uh, three different areas of my experience in, in, uh, in partnerships. First of all, with USAID in Honduras and Costa Rica. Uh, next, with my, the work I did with the International Youth Foundation when I was uh, Vice President for Global Partnerships. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that RTI is doing with alliances in Central America. Now, Honduras, <laughs> to kick things off. Uh, as Derek said, I had the bug after I went back and got my MBA and worked with a couple of large uh, global corporations, but I really wanted to go back into international development. And so I was fortunate enough to be asked to go to Honduras to uh, help design, at least this was the way it was described to me, to design an export agribusiness program for land reform farmers in Honduras, many of whom had actually never farmed before. So I thought that was an interesting uh, approach, and I told AID, this was long, I was then at the time with General Mills, working on things like Wheaties and Cheerios. And so I said, you know, you really don't need to, to pay me to come down to Tegucigalpa to tell you that this is a mistake. Don't do this. <laughs> you can't do this in Honduras. So this is a very short consultancy. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, I went, and I went back to uh, looking outside at the snow. Um, but no, they persisted. They said, no, the Honduran government has a strategy in place. They really want to try to expand uh, support to land reform uh, farmers. They want to give the peasant farmers, the campesinos, a chance to improve their lives, et cetera. And this is our time. So I went down. And so let me just uh, paint for you the picture in 1977 in Honduras. The goal was to assist land reform farmers in developing an export-based agribusiness. And there was going to be uh, really important infrastructure investments made uh, in one of the largest agricultural valleys in Honduras uh, in irrigation, and they were going to provide the land to uh, campesino farmers. At the same time, this was also a period of time in Central America and Latin America overall where there was intense political activity and a fighting going on, going on between landlords and people who wanted to squat and take over their land because the disinherited wanted their, their slice of the pie. And so this was a time when the Honduran government was trying to ride these two waves. Also, there had been something that had happened which was pretty extraordinary in terms of public-private partnerships on the corporate side. The chairman of the board of uh, United Brands, Chiquita Bananas, had committed suicide. He committed suicide because his company was caught paying a million-dollar bribe. And that's when a million dollars was still a lot, a lot of money. A million dollars to the president of Honduras so that they would lower the price, the tax on bananas, per box tax on bananas, which obviously was important to their bottom line. He was a very religious man, very, very devout, devout person. And so their headquarters is in the Pan American building and in New York City, and he threw his executive chair through the window and jumped out behind it. He was so embarrassed. Not many people do that these days. Probably some people should do that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so you had the scandal with Chiquita Bananas, just as I arrived, or a little bit before I got there. The U.S. Embassy, USAID, did not want to work with the private sector, and certainly not with the banana company in Honduras. Now think about the way the world has changed. They didn't want to do that. Uh, and the Honduran government, of course, was, was very much wanted to keep their hands clean of any ties with banana companies. 
There was an absence of necessary infrastructure for high value export crops in terms of shipping and marketing. There was really very little refrigerated shipping in the country except what the banana companies had. And so as I looked at the situation and conducted an assessment, I decided that the only way that this project could get off the ground would be to form a partnership with the banana companies because they controlled the shipping and the refrigeration. And they also had, as you know, anybody who knows anything about growing uh, tropical uh, products, you know that the banana companies have a university equivalent of technical expertise in the Philippines, in Honduras, or wherever you're going to grow pineapples, bananas. So they had uh, hundreds of people who could actually make a difference. So we had the elements of the deal. I identified the, comp the leaders within the camp companies, and there were two companies. One was Chiquita with United Brands. The other was Dole with Castle & Cook. They were desperate to form a partnership with the U.S. government and with the Honduran government. As a matter of fact, they provided about 50 of their leading PhDs and scientists free of charge to work with me on the project. People, experts in agronomists, entomologists, post-harvest specialists, marketing specialists, etc. The Honduran government had a young hotshot uh, minister of agriculture just came back from Mississippi State where he got his, his PhD on, under USAID funding. He wanted to try this deal. And then I convinced USAID and the embassy that this was this, the ambassador, this is worth trying. And so we put together a package which included all the technical assistance one could possibly imagine to grow cucumbers and tomatoes you know, on, the, on this new agrarian farm investment. And we signed a deal with the banana company so that they would provide technical assistance, purchase the crop at the farm gate, ship it, and market it in the United States all done under their, under their labels. So we immediately uh, catapulted these peasant farmers into an export market via a public-private partnership. That was the first time I saw the power of this kind of an arrangement, if in fact you can overcome the barriers and the constraints to working together. So what were some of the lessons learned? Oh, by the way, very important point. Today, in that valley in Honduras, the, the children of these farmers continue to export products to the United States with different companies now. They actually package the, the foods that you and I buy, uh, like cucumbers and tomatoes, in Honduras, and they ship it directly to the supermarkets. It's changed everything in that valley, and the social transformation has been extraordinary. So what were the lessons learned from that? First of all, you need to form a leadership team. So we had to put together leaders from the government of Honduras, the banana companies, AID, uh, and obviously the peasant farmers. You have to give e each partner an equal voice and you have to clearly define the rules of engagement in terms of how you're going to operate together and how you're going to implement the program. You have to have an ability to understand that you can have shared goals but also individual goals from a corporate standpoint. And of course that all important thing that we talk so much about now in terms of development, we had to have measurable, uh, measurable results. And you can imagine putting together that disparate group of partners was quite an extraordinary experience. So that's uh, the Honduras where I kind of got my, my kickoff in terms of public-private partnerships. Then Costa Rica. So I was in Costa Rica as the head of the first private sector development office in, the US, in USAID in Costa Rica in 1986. So there we had a different situation. The Costa Ricans wanted to transform their economy from a dependence on bananas and coffee to where it is today, which is uh, very much uh, engaged in fast growth, uh, light manufacturing, uh, high value agribusiness agri products, and tourism. At the same time, as you might remember, or some of you probably have read about, there was a war going on in Central America. It looks very tame now when we think about the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. But those look pretty vicious for those of us on the ground in Central America. And uh, when you talk to an American company about investing in Costa Rica, they would say, are you kidding me? There's a war in El Salvador and Nicaragua. You've got the Contras in Honduras. They're about to go into Nicaragua. Why would I invest a dime in that country? And so, of course, we portray Costa Rica as being an oasis of peace in Central America. To the extent that the government of Costa Rica and the private sector of Costa Rica thought about trade, they thought about the Central American common market. Pretty weak market to depend on for any significant economic growth. We designed a couple of different projects. 
One was investment promotion, but it was different than from investment promotion as traditionally done around the world. We designed an investment promotion program that was led by the private sector, so we had to get that, make, get that concession from the Costa Rican government. Secondly, we create a merchant bank to invest in, in uh, these new um, uh, export-based industries, and then we also created two other banks to be involved in export financing. Uh, and one thing that's kind of interesting about Costa Rica at that time, and even to this day, the Costa Rican banking sector was, is nationalized. It was inefficient, uh, unprofitable, but it was nationalized. It was seen to be part of the national patrimony and not to be touched. So that was an ongoing issue that we had to deal with. But we were successful. And why were we successful? Because, again, we had those key elements, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But I first want to talk about what was essential for the environment in Costa Rica to move forward in terms of trade and investment promotion. First of all, when we sat down and looked at what we wanted to do, this was a, a team of Costa Rican uh, leaders, Costa Rican government leaders, and, and uh, leaders in the business community. We looked at Ireland. We looked at the Asian Tigers. We said, there's obviously a model here that we can use. But we wanted to be led by the, by the private sector because we were pretty certain that the government could not lead such a new, innovative, and fast-moving strategy. We also knew that they had to get the policy environment right. So the government had to be, obviously, in the lead in getting the policy environment right. And you know what all these things are. I'll just touch on them. Uh, stable monetary and fiscal policy, uh, competitively priced infrastructure, water, transportation, uh, et cetera, roads. Uh, you have to have a long-term commitment from the government. We had to have a commitment that they were going to allow foreign investment to come into their country and operate on a level playing field had to have that, and the government had to agree to that. And the government had to agree to let the private sector be the face of Costa Rica around the world. So we brought together a leadership team of the government, the private sector, USAID, and, we've, and we created these institutions that I mentioned earlier. So what are the results today? Well, Costa Rica, of course, is a real success story. Uh, one of the, the flagship project that uh, came to Costa Rica a little bit later on after I left Costa Rica, but based on what we did at the time, was, of course, Intel. Intel really transformed Costa Rica. And there's a lot of uh, information in the literature that you can see about what Intel did and what it meant to Costa Rica. It changed everything. Costa Rica was a very sleepy, nice, peaceful dem democracy, but it wasn't going anywhere in terms of economic growth until we changed the face of Costa Rica through that partnership. What did we learn in doing that? We learned that, first of all, you have to have leaders. You had to have a national strategy that was formulated but with full participation of the private sector and, and, uh, and the government. And you had to have internal champions. We had to have people inside each one of, of these organizations that would be the go-to person in that organization to make things happen. Because as you can imagine, or you may be, you, I'm sure you can imagine, this did not run smoothly. <laughs> there were lots of fights, lots of early morning 7 o'clock <laughs> breakfast meetings over issues that had uh, evolved into mountains from being a molehill. Uh, there, was there were a lot of jealousies. As things started to take off, there was a lot of who gets the credit for this? Who was responsible for this? Who's the person who actually brought intel to Costa Rica? I mean, there's a thousand people who tell me today that a lot of, I, I, sometimes, as a matter of fact, I'll play a game with, with Costa Ricans I meet for the first time, either there or, or in, anywhere else in the world. I'll say, They'll say, you were in Costa Rica, what did you do? And I'll talk to them and say, well, I'm, I'm a businessman. And you know, I was one of the guys that helped bring Intel to, uh, to Costa Rica. I said, is that right? <laughs> Amazing. You know, you have about 1,000 cousins, friends, who all were responsible for bringing Intel to Costa Rica. Right? I said, that's really, really amazing. So you know, you know the old story. When there's success, there's lots of people who want to be the padrinos. The other thing is that we had to have, make sure that we had equal voice for each partner and a clear definition of roles and responsibilities. And we had goals, and we focused on measurable results. And so Costa Rica today is a very different country than what it was back then because of the power of public-private partnerships, which as it continues to be part of the strategy of the current Audius administration. As a matter of fact, another interesting factoid, it was under President Audius that we started this program. And now he's back as president again. And the person who was my principal counterpart and leader on the Costa Rican side is now the Costa Rican ambassador to the United States. He just presented his credentials last month. Pretty, quite amazing story. Uh, now, moving outside of USAID to the International Youth Foundation. 
Uh, when I left AID after my uh, last overseas assignment as mission director in South Africa, I joined the International Youth Foundation because, I, as, as um, Derek mentioned, I've worked in all three sectors, and so I still hadn't done the foundation side yet, so I needed to do that on my checklist of personal goals. But I joined IOF because they had a wonderful mission. Their mission was to improve the lives of young people wherever they live, learn, work, or play. Now, who could be against that? Everybody's for that. And I've got to tell you, in terms of my new position there, I'm putting together global partnerships with uh, global corporations. Uh, no one that I spoke to of the literally hundreds of companies that I talked to over four years ever told me that this is a bad idea. We don't want to support you. They might have told me, we can't give you this much money. We can't do it this way, or the timing is not right. But they never said this wasn't a mission that we would support as part of our corporate social responsibility. So at IYF, we faced an, an interesting challenge. Now, IYF, most people had never even heard of IYF. Maybe people in this room probably still haven't heard of the International Youth Foundation. They were a, uh, we were a small foundation with big, ambitious goals. We were led by a guy by the name of Rick Little, who probably, if Rick were in the business community, he'd be Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. He is an incredible visionary, incredible uh, social capitalist, if you will, who had a great vision. And he actually had created IYF by receiving the largest donation at the time. This is pre-Gates, of course, right? Back in, uh, back in the, uh, I guess, the late, the early 90s. Uh, Rick had received the largest grant in the history of American philanthropy for a startup foundation, $60 million from the Kellogg Foundation. And he had no track record whatsoever. Anyway, so Rick had big ideas. We wanted to broaden and take our program worldwide. So what we had to do was tap into the growth of, co of the corporate social responsibility movement that was taking off at that time. And so I targeted the companies that saw themselves as being the best corporate citizens in the world. Companies such as Nokia, Nike, Nike, interestingly enough, even though they were facing significant problems at the time because of so-called labor practices in the Far East. Uh, Merrill Lynch, which used to be a great name at one time. You know, things have certainly changed for Merrill Lynch. That bull's been gored. Um, back up, you raised that part of the ticket. <laughs> and Lucent, remember Lucent, the high flyer of the, of the IT, the tech, the, uh, the, uh, the technology industry, uh, they were our immediate targets. So what we did was we sat down with them and we said, we will give you something that very few other NGOs can give you if you're interested in having a broad-based corporate social responsibility strategy. We'll give you a turnkey program in 30 to 40 countries instantly if you will work with the International Youth Foundation. And the way we did that is because we were not an operational foundation. We formed partnerships. We had a network of partners in, uh, of the leading youth service organizations in every country where we worked. And we worked in both the developing world and also the developed world. So or we worked in, in the industrialized countries, such as Ireland and Germany. Uh, we had a, uh, a foundation in Finland, et cetera. But also we were in Brazil, South Africa, uh, Indonesia, uh, it's, et cetera. So at that time, these companies hadn't made a decision yet to create a large, robust corporate social responsibility unit. A lot of what they were doing, which was pretty small at the time in terms of the companies I just mentioned, was handled by their foundations or, or by somebody who was assistant to the president. And so we asked them to think broadly, to think big. And that was quite a challenge because they did, in, in a couple of cases, they had just learned about us. We, we had just been introduced to them. So we were successful because, number one, we went right to the top. I always find that when you want to do something new and bold and innovative, if you start at the mid, at the mid level with an organization, you're only, if you are successful, it's going to be a very small piece of the pie. If you really want to make a difference, you've got to start at the top. You've got to get the top person to buy in to the vision. And that's what we did with Phil Knight at Nike, with the, uh, with the president of, of Nokia, uh, and the president of Lucent. They bought into it. Then they assigned somebody who was really interested in, in making this a success to work with us. And that made all the difference in the world. And that person had to be not just a special assistant. It had to be a person who could open doors and get decisions made within that corporate structure. Because we also tried to make it, we moved away from 
the philanthropic side of the business to the marketing side of the business. We wanted to be in the line divisions. We wanted the line managers, we wanted the managing directors of their subsidiaries around the world to be involved in this. And just to give you a little story, Cisco Systems became a big partner of ours. And so I went out to, to Manila uh, to speak to the managing director of Cisco. And so he got, before I arrived there, the Cisco headquarters, the chairman of the board of Cisco, sent a message to his guy in Manila and said, Aaron Williams and a group of people from, from IYF and some of our senior executives from Cisco are coming out to talk to you about a new partnership in, in the Philippines. And, you know, he was polite <laughs> when we got there. This is just another headache. Somebody in San Jose had this brilliant idea. Why, you know, why were you here? Uh, let's have dinner. Everything's fine. <laughs> and so during dinner, I told him, I said, you know, I know you see this as being a pain in the neck. I said, I don't blame you. If I were where you were, I'd feel the same way. I said, but I think there's one thing you have not uh, quite understood about how we're going to do this. We're going to take this over and turn it into a project that will be labeled, that will be branded Cisco. You will not have to manage it on a day-to-day -day basis, and you're going to be tied to the leading intellectual leaders in the Philippines who care about youth and development. I said, now, if that's not going to be attractive to you, then dinner can be cut short. And I said, oh, by the way, we want $3 million to do it. And so he thought about it, and then he read his email again <laughs> from the chairman, and he decided to do it. And he became one of our biggest supporters. And he did, he replicated that program in three other countries where he moved to subsequently. But we went, at the, we started at the top, and we offered some, the people on the ground, the managing director, something that was going to be very important to them. The other thing is that we really took the management burden off of their hands. But we gave them all the credit. Every ribbon cutting, every major piece of, every media story was always the managing director of Cisco, Philippines, blah, 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 blah. And he met some people in the Philippines that he never would have met before, who really made a difference in terms of Cisco's corporate image and Cisco's ability to invest in young people in the Philippines. It wasn't always that way. I mean, I had some, I had a couple of tough battles. One was with S.C. Johnson, one of, the most, one of the wonderful companies of the world. Maybe some of you have worked with S.C. Johnson. They're really an outstanding company. And they wanted to do a global strategy, and so we flew out to Racine to, to make a pitch to them. And uh, after we made our presentation and we sold just about everybody in the company, they decided not to move forward because at the end of the day, they didn't think our brand was large enough and important enough to be associated with such a wonderful global corporation, which was a you know, reasonable decision on their part, but that was one of the few times that we really couldn't crack the top. We, we got right to the top, but uh, we couldn't move it to the next level. Now, of course, uh, subsequently, after I left IYF, they've gone back, they had another bite of the apple, and they do have a partnership with S.C. Johnson. But in all of these, in all of these programs and, and that we put together, and we took off, we put together something like, um, I think 25 partnerships in less than two and a half years. And the only way a small organization can do that is if you have a well-managed network of partners who can actually offer something on the ground to the, com the companies that are interested in your corporate social responsibility. The other thing that happens also is that through backward linkages, you end up working with the government, especially when you're working, talking about youth and education and other issues affecting youth. And that gives companies a chance to have a different kind of a dialogue with the government outside of the commercial venture. And again, the same lessons apply. We had to have champions. We had to have leadership. We had to have measurable results. As you can imagine, in the corporate world, that was very important. Every quarter, we had to report to all of our corporate clients, you know, what, what exactly were the results. We had to explain what these results meant for people who were not uh, used to working in, in a nonprofit, in the nonprofit space. So that was the, some of the experiences I had with International Youth Foundation. We can go back to that later on in the Q&A. Now let me talk a little bit about uh, RTI uh, and something that we're doing which is very innovative and interesting called the alliances or alianzas in Central America. In Guatemala, there was an, there was an urgent need uh, to invest in education and health for all the obvious reasons of underdevelopment in Guatemala. And we believe that there was a way to tap the private sector in Guatemala, which is a very wealthy private sector, to invest in education and health. To, because the Guatemalan government, even with major donor support, cannot solve the problem of health care 
and education uh, and the, the poor quality of education in Guatemala, especially in the, mo in, the, in the most underserved parts of Guatemala, in the Indian, Indian communities in the mountains. So we put together a program which will allow the co-location of health programs and education programs in schools and other public buildings and villages in poor communities throughout Guatemala. And the private sector thought this was a great way for them to show support for the Guatemalan government and to be engaged in corporate social responsibility. The purpose was to leverage private sector cash uh, and we wanted to put in, this was funded by the way by USAID. For every dollar the USAID put in, we were going to uh, raise two dollars. We now have raised three to one over the last year and a half. Every major corporation in Guatemala is involved in this program and every major American subsidiary in Guatemala is engaged in the program. I mean, it's a situation where if you're not part of this club, you're embarrassed. It's really moved quite a bit. And we've got, and the target age groups are women in reproductive age, children and youth, broad range of partners, corporate. We've also got NGOs. We've got universities, schools, ministries, foundations. We have local leadership. We have a dynamic uh, chief of party in Guatemala who manages this program for us. Uh, Oh, in a very short period of time, we put together, we have lined up 89 corporate partners, and we've got 90 different alliances. When there was a natural disaster hurricane uh, stand in Guatemala, we were able to put together a national uh, vaccination program right away against measles because of these public-private partnerships. And we reached out to parts of Guatemala that we had never reached before. Uh, as I mentioned, the investment is extraordinary. Right now, we're operating around $22 million in terms of the partners. Total investment is $30 million in a very short period of time. This has been so successful at USAID under its Global Development Alliance Program. I just got through briefing them um, last week about the program, and they're interested in trying to replicate this model in other parts of the, of the aid world. So we're very pleased with that. And of course, what were the lessons learned? Well. One of the things that we found interesting about this, because this is one of the first times I've ever, ever worked on a project where leveraging was so important, one of the principal goals of the project, it's hard to certify what leverage is on both sides of the equation. Um, when you donate a, a, a computer or a, print or a copying machine to an NGO or to a school, is that leverage? We had to define that for our partners. Uh, Training for, for budgeting and reporting has also added value that it was not really appreciated before. We've had to help both the public sector and the private sector understand how to design and manage grants. Uh, this is something that was pretty foreign to them in, in the past. And of course, we've had to make sure that we've had the appropriate technical assistance and training to support them. But at the same time, this is always at the end of the day, I think this is the one overriding lesson about, uh, about public-private partnerships. Leadership counts. You really have to have the right leaders in place. And you have to have the internal leaders within each organization who you can relate to and work with to, in order, uh, to enable you to overcome the inevitable problems that you run into in terms of public-private partnerships. There's just no, there's no way around that. It's absolutely critical. And of course, the other, other part about this, which is, which is um, part of the interesting mix of partnerships is that we're working with the U.S. government, the Guatemalan government, and then with private entities, both in Guatemala and, uh, and offshore. So that'll give you an idea of hopefully a flavor of some, and some examples of what I've worked on in terms of my history of working on public-private partnerships. I'm a firm believer that this is absolutely essential given the challenges that we all face today in our world. I think I've looked at uh, the overview paper that Derek shared with me the other night, and I couldn't agree more with the basic premises of that. Uh, now is the time when we need to tap both public and private resources and leadership to make a difference in this world. And I think in the developing world, it's especially crucial. And so the work that you're doing, the work that you're interested in, the people that you're going to teach, and the ones who are going to go forth and work in this field are extremely important to, I think, the future of our world. So let me close my formal remarks there and open it up to Q&A. One thing that we talked about a little bit this morning, um, 
are some of the different kinds of contractual arrangements uh, that you can find between public and private partners. And I'm wondering, especially with the first example that you raised with like the banana company there, um, how did these actors feel that the other um, that the other organizations they're working with would actually carry through with what they said they would do? Mm -hmm. uh, like, did they have contracts um, that would specify what they would do? And, and I guess if so, what kind of enforcement mm -hmm. mechanisms were there um, to actually see that, say, the government would actually carry through with mm -hmm. what they said they would do? And I guess the second part of that is, is um, what kinds of how how did you see the contracts in terms of like the in terms of them being more transactional or perhaps more relational? Mm -hmm. Because we talked a lot this morning about um, how some of these arrangements can either start out perhaps more relational mm -hmm. and then actually develop into being more transactional. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you saw, I guess, any transition. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about the contract, what did the company want to see in terms of contractual relationships? Was it from a company perspective or from a Honduran perspective? Well, um, I guess from either one, but I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. it seemed from your story that there was, um, I guess, some tension between like the banana company and between the Honduran government. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how they were able to get these people uh, to feel that they could count upon the other mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Well, um, that's a very interesting question because in the beginning, no one wanted a contract with the other party. They said, we're going to do this, but it's an experiment, and we're not signing anything. <laughs> that was the banana company's position at first. Because, you know, and, but they're in a very privileged position. They didn't have to sign a contract with the Honduran government because the Honduran government depended on them for 95% of their foreign exchange earnings. So they figured they weren't going to run into any problems with the Honduran government, per se. Uh, and, if, and if they did, this was just an off-the-books uh, off experiment, and so who cared? So they weren't really, really concerned about that. The Honduran government, on the other hand, did want a contract with the banana company. And so we agreed, after long hours of negotiation, just like the Paris peace talks, without all of the good French food, <laughs> We agreed on a memorandum of understanding, right? And everybody agreed to that 10-page memorandum of understanding about what their responsibilities and roles would be. Uh, now, as it turns out, when I tell this story to the grandchildren of the people who initially worked with me on the, and the Honduran peasant farmers, they're no longer peasant farmers, by the way. Now, these are the, the wealthy people of the valley. They laugh and say, we, won't, we don't do anything without a contract. <laughs> so it, it was really relational more than contractual at that time. And, um, and the MOU held its own for quite some time. based on local context, local yeah. needs. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you have had it, experience trying to take those models to a larger scale. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about how to manage that scalability versus local context? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, in terms of scaling up, you need to have a model that is scalable, I think, before you can think about this. Sometimes you work on a partnership which is fairly unique to the local conditions where you are. But in the case of IYF, for example, we had scalability. Um, and our biggest challenge, Ray, was to convince a company that we were not going to create a program customized to the corporate needs. That was our biggest challenge. You know, for example, these are all very smart people at Nokia, Nike, et cetera. They, have, they run massive marketing campaigns. They sell millions of dollars of product. And so we told them that we d were going to create a program in Brazil, in South Africa, in the Philippines, in Thailand, that would reflect the local needs based on local expertise, they balked at that. They said, well, I don't know if we want to do that. That doesn't sound like something that's going to be productive for us. How are we going to brand it, et cetera. So our big challenge was to convince them to do that. Once we overcame that hurdle, then we were able to scale up in a number of different countries. Once we convinced Nokia, for example, that we could do a similar kind of a program based on local, uh, local expertise, 
in Thailand, in the Philippines, in Brazil, then they became much more relaxed about the second generation of projects that we presented to them based on local expertise. So I think you have to have a scalable model. The other thing, you have to have a, a partner who's willing to invest the resources needed to do this. You know, I had a rule of thumb when I went to pitch a corporation uh, that I would never ask for less than five to ten million dollars for a global program. Never. Because initially they're used to having NGOs come in, especially small NGOs, and say, can I get a half a million dollar grant to do a program in, you know, in, um, in Venezuela or, or in the Dominican Republic? And after long amounts of discussion and hand wringing, they'll give you a half a million dollars maybe if they like the idea. I always thought that was a mistake. I wanted to go for the big ask. And, that, and it, it shook them up because they weren't used to it. I remember uh, the S.C. Johnson case when I said that in order, they said, well, what's the price tag for a global program that will start up with 10 countries? I said, probably seven to eight million dollars. They said, no, that's a lot of money. I said, you're a big company. <laughs> <laughs> right? right? And if you profess to be global and large, this is what we want to see. That's what I would want to see in, in order to demonstrate your leadership. Uh, and that was just, I don't want to pick on S.C. Johnson, it just comes to mind, but a lot of companies felt that way at first. And the other thing that was, that was important about scalability was companies at first in, in the early years did not want to pay our legitimate admin and overhead costs. They said, we want to fund programs. We're not going to spend money on overhead and a lot of headquarters stuff. We want to fund programs. And so now this is a company <laughs> that knows what overhead and administrative costs are, right? They wouldn't run their company this way. And we spent a long time battling with them over that. But once they became true believers, then it became easier in the out years to convince them to do that. But I know I'm, Merrill Lynch is a perfect example. We had hand-to-hand -hand combat over our overhead rate, which, which was pretty low. I think it was something like 7 or 8%, pretty, pretty reasonable for an NGO. And they thought that was taking, you know, food, or not food, but uh, books out of the hands of young people in Brazil. <laughs> and we just couldn't be spending that kind of money on overhead. Uh, and fees. So it was an interesting process. I think the other thing, the last thing I'll say about scalability that comes to mind is uh, you have to have um, the staff to provide proper oversight as you're scaling up. Otherwise, it'll move so fast that you won't be able to manage it properly, judge the, the, the results, and be able to adapt to changing conditions and uh, still deliver a high quality product. Can I ask a supplemental? Yeah, well, yeah. Local youth right. organizations. How did you anticipate that capacity when you first started to associate with them? And then, if you didn't mm -hmm. anticipate it correctly, how did you correct that? What a great question. You know, you have great questions. <laughs> that was a huge problem because all organizations are not equal. So, we rolled the dice. And I learned a lot about some of our organizations, unfortunately, after I had rolled the dice. <laughs> And I spent a lot of time, a lot of, half, half of my travel was going to meet with corporate partners around the world. The other half was going to meet with our partners to say, we just signed this big deal with our, this great corporate partner. You have got to deliver. <laughs> so that was a problem. And I wouldn't say that we, we, were, we had uniformly good results with all of our partners. But we did try, and this is where staff comes in. We built up a cadre of training staff at headquarters in Baltimore that we could deploy to work with those uh, partner organizations that did not have the strength to carry out the program. And the other thing I found out, very interesting, an uh, interesting thing about transparency. Because we were very transparent in explaining this to our corporate partners, they were very understanding of that and prepared to work with us to help train and strengthen and even invest in the strengthening of the organizations that they found to be such extraordinary partners in the countries. So by being, it was a big debate in our, in our corporate headquarters about, well, we can't tell them that Poland's not ready <laughs> to take this project on. And, I, and I, I said, well, I think we need to tell them that Poland's not ready and why Poland isn't ready or the Polish Youth Foundation is not ready and how uh, Microsoft Poland can help strengthen that organization. And it, it worked out, in 99% of the cases, it worked out very well. So transparency really can make a difference if you, Believe in it and really push it. Mm -hmm. um, what did Cisco say was in it for them, if you will, for 
for mm -hmm. development, or what would you ascribe that Cisco might say? Well, Cisco has a wonderful signature program called Cisco Learning Academies, that you've probably heard of. You know, and the reason they create these academies is because Cisco knows that there is an ongoing shortage of IT professionals in the world, and therefore they need to develop a cadre of IT professionals worldwide. So I'm sorry, it's not Learning Academy, Network Academy, excuse me. And so they thought it would be good to have an NGO partner that could help them learn more about youth in, in these countries and help them as they expanded their network academies around the world. One of our great partners, actually, uh, in the early years was uh, Versailles University in West Bank, Gaza. They were a huge partner with Cisco, and we were one of the ones that introduced them to that organization. 